Good afternoon and welcome to the session, um, The Right to Access the Internet, Upholding a Human Right. This is presented to you by democracy.net.ph, which is an ICT and internet rights advocacy organization in the Philippines, and by Digital Empowerment Fund, which is working for um, improving uh, internet access in um, different communities in India. Uh, we have here our guests uh, from different organizations from India, Pakistan, the Philippines, um, from the US, and from Indonesia. So I'd like to request our speakers to first introduce themselves just one line before we get started. My one line is that I'm Chad Garcia Ramelo. I live here in the Philippines and I work for the Association for Progressive Communication. I'm, I'm Chris. I manage public policy for Mozilla and I'm based in California in the United States. I'm Mary Grace Santos. I'm an independent ICT policy researcher. And I welcome you to the Philippines where there are more Facebook users than internet users. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sada Khan. I'm from Pakistan and I work as the program manager for digital rights and freedom of expression at Bankstar. Hi, I'm Ritu and I'm working with the Digital Empowerment Foundation as a program manager. And uh, we have been working for the last uh, 10 years for, on the point of access. Hi, my name is Johar Alam. I'm from the Open Internet Exchange Point in Indonesia and the Internet Data Center. Uh, Yes, that's it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Case Pomar. I'm the Dutch Human Rights Ambassador. Okay. So now we're going to get started. Um, majority of the world population is still not online. More than 50% of internet users, however, are from the developing world. So what we want to talk about this afternoon is um, what initiatives can be undertaken to improve the level of internet access and at the same time having uh, already gotten to that level of internet access we're also going to ask our speakers how this uh, the access to internet has improved um, the protection of human rights freedom of expression etc so I'd like to first start on the um, topic of how uh, specific countries uh, where our representatives come from have um, done in order to improve um, internet access in their respective um, location. Hi, thanks. Uh, in Indonesia, we actually started internet in 1994. And what's interesting about it, uh, different from other countries like Singapore, is the university started it. So it wasn't the government. The government has no idea what, what the internet was. And we developed it on our own because the government did not understand what the internet is. So back in 1997, we created an internet exchange that connects everything in Indonesia into one single router. And uh, about that time, uh, our old Suharto regime uh, was at the point peak of his power. And he censors everything. I mean, radio, television, everything he knows except the internet. So by using the internet, the uh, students actually managed to organize and revolt and topple down a government, which was amazing. So ever since then, we, we strongly believe that uh, the people has the right to control the internet because government changes, but the people will still remain the people. And uh, about the cost of, of the internet, which we have uh, significantly uh, maybe uh, have the price reduced. It's because from day one, since the internet was started, 94, 97, we have an exchange, we have the open ISP now, which connects everything, it's free. I mean, you don't have to pay anything, you don't have to sign a contract, nothing. Everyone connects to a single internet exchange. Hence, that means big companies like the telcos, uh, startup companies like the uh, content provider connects to the same device and because of that all you have to pay for is uh, your last mile link in Indonesia so our uniqueness is in other countries the internet is your last mile and your international traffic 
So that's how much you pay for the internet. In Indonesia, we have lots of local content. Hence, we have a internet cafe who will subscribe a last mile lease line link at 10 megs, but only subscribe 64K international link because we know for a fact that local content is free and there is no blocking between the operators and the content providers. And that reduces the price significantly. We even have an ISP that connects to the open ISP, but does not subscribe to any international link. So they can simply just sell the internet to the end users without having to pay anything to the open ISP. So that's uh, the price reduction. The access is another thing. Because we're very creative, we even managed to have this village net, at the RW net, you know, roughly it's, it's village net, where all this village people, not the singing group, <laughs> the people in the village, they sit together, they put switches in different parts of the village, they pull Ethernet cables, and so all the houses are connected together. Then they make this wireless 2.4 Wajan Bolik, which is a pan with a 2.4 gig uh, connected to the ISPs. And they have internet access, which the government regularly cracks down because it's illegal to do so. But yes, we do everything we can to reduce the internet price because we do want the information. And our only hurdle there, I know I'm free to speak here, is actually our government. Thanks. In India, the, uh, we call it as a democratic country, and yes, we have a everything in a democratic society being in India. We do have a large agenda like a digital India, then there's a lot of uh, another panel kind of uh, programs which is done, done by government. And internet, if I go back to the in 2000, then there's a, internet is uh, it's said to be a free, and but uh, we have free, uh, being a free country, we have a, a internet is a free country. Here. And um, on the aspect of what we are doing, is we are trying to connect the air, uh, trying to provide the internet, providing the last mile connectivity. To like in Indonesia, we have a uh, we have a project called we have a program called wireless for communities, where we are trying to provide last mile connectivity using unlicensed spectrum 2.4 gigahertz. And uh, there are other programs which we are trying to do it. As but. The challenge here is that we, we don't have uh, support from the government. We don't have, uh, even though we, it's called as a democratic society, but we don't have uh, support from the government to recognize such uh, wireless or such small projects which are already done by committee. So uh, access, though access is free to India, but the access is uh, uh, the major, 70% uh, uh, of the population is not connected because of an infrastructure barrier or the barrier of a content is not there or the, there are many uh, social and cultural barriers also including in that society. So as because of those barriers, we are connected and still we are not connected. So 70 percent of the population is still not connected. And in, the, in that sense, like uh, what are the models which we are trying to adopt it to the, these uh, small models which we are trying to adopt? Either it's a village network or either it's a wireless for communities, either it's some other network, which we are trying to explore it. So uh, more or less, uh, we are still in a phase of exploring and we are still struggling with the with the government side on the access side. Uh, though we have, today we have one news in this aspect that uh, IT access has been dissolved or something to provide the intermediary that we yeah. So, uh, I don't know what is the what is the result out of that, but yes, we are hopeful for that purpose. Um, okay, first I will apologize a bit because access is not really my area of expertise in terms of physical access. What I was more on is access to content. Um, but since we are a digital rights organization, I do have a bit of a background, and I'll start very briefly with the, how Pakistan is connected. Uh, or not connected. Uh, so the 30 percent of the population is supposed to have internet access, but uh, there's the mobile penetration is more than 70 percent now. And just last year we got the 3G and 4G licenses. So we are hoping that in in the real physical sense, 
access to high speed broadband internet uh, would move out of the urban center then move towards rural centers uh, as well uh, that said uh, the threats are still very very real the price of the internet has obviously dropped from when it started it's way cheaper now uh, still given the infl inflation rate and whatnot it's not really affordable to the rural communities uh, right now um, but more than that affordability of course yeah, issue number one but the second issue is the presence of information dark areas in pakistan we have at least two armed conflict zones um, there is a tribal region in the northwest of the country and then there is uh, balochistan which is again uh, facing an armed militancy now these two areas are the ones that are most vulnerable when it comes to access to any kind of information it's not just the internet uh, but also they are deprived access to the mainstream media, which makes internet all the more important. And yet these two are the areas where internet speed is the lowest. And there are physical threats in form of groups who can just go and shut down exchanges, who can shut down, uh, who can physically switch off internet services um, as needs be in terms of national security. Um, the context of national security is something that you will find across board in all the in all internet related matters in Pakistan. Um, the, the political will is um, improving, I'd say, but uh, it's also, there are, there are questions about the sincerity of the government's will to provide everybody with a license with the PTA is by law supposed to put off a certain amount of money they're supposed to pay the government a certain amount of money that is supposed to be put in the accessibility fund and the government originally is supposed to use that fund to ensure universal access is available however the government especially the present government has done in pakistan is to pull all that money the accessibility fund pull it into a larger development fund and use that money to pay off circular debts for the energy sector so money that was given by telcos um, money that in the end the end consumer is paying for to ensure that access moves out of urban centers is being used to pay for electricity circular debt um, and then the problem doesn't stop here um, it's not just political access but access to content access to political ideological content that is being increasingly censored uh, we have had uh, unfortunately we have had this whole series of terrorism events incidents um, that have focused, that have completely framed the debate in the National Assembly. And where um, in December this year, we have had this list of recommendations which said something like uh, the social media monitoring should be made a territory of the National Anti-Terrorism Counter-Terrorism Authority, which raises question for whether people are allowed to, what, what are they accessing, what are they expressing. So the access to actual content is also being threatened a lot. Uh, and finally, very briefly, I'll touch upon the issue of net neutrality because it's, it's really important and there is a complete lack of understanding on the government's part. Uh, YouTube has been banned in Pakistan for two and a half years almost, uh, and yet PTCL, the Pakistan Telecommunication uh, Limited, the, the main internet service provider, they go and do a deal with Daily Motion, hosting their videos on local servers without even understanding how it completely goes against the principles of net neutrality. During the World Cup, different telecos are offering Twitter without data charges. Uh, so things like that are happening and without the understanding. And obviously for public, it's good. You know, if you think about it, I'm getting free Twitter. So the, the debate is, there's, there's no debate. Instead, people are kind of celebrating the fact that they're getting the charges free Twitter or Facebook uh, on their cell phones here. I think we'll get back to that later. Yeah. OK, so in the Philippines, um, I'm sure you've already noticed how how bad internet service is here. So I'm not going to elaborate on that. Um, like Indonesia, government really has you know no knowledge of how telecommunications and ICT uh, actually, actually work. Um, the private sector is the dominant telco in the Philippines. They've always been, it has always been like that for several decades. Uh, the incumbent telco, which uh, rolled out the national, which owns the national backbone, owns everything from the international gateway facilities to the backbone to the last mile. 
That has always been the case. So if you're a competitor, uh, if you want to get into the market, telecommunications market, you'll have to deal with a with a telco that has entrenched not only investments but also political and financial interests as well. So the Philippines seems to have a penchant for um, advertising that we want investors, but then we set up all all sorts of barriers for investors to come in. Um, I don't know if that's unique to our country, but that has not worked for us so far. Um, the second largest carrier, which is Globe, um, came in about, uh, I think, in the 19, late 1990s, and it was the first uh, carrier to actually um, introduce SMS. And um, since the time that SMS um, was introduced, it was for free at the time, uh, mobile phone penetration went up. And uh, later on, the, the, the incumbent PLDT, which now owns Smart, which is the largest mobile service provider, followed suit. And then they, I don't know, they just decided we'll charge for SMS. So now it's not free. Um, so access-wise, it's the private sector that's um, basically providing access. But recently, the government, through the ICT office, is trying to provide access to, supposedly provide access to unserved and underserved areas through the free Wi-Fi project. But um, there has been some discussions. Um, there are consultations happening because right now, as I just found out, um, the focus will be primarily metropolitan urban areas, which which actually defeats the purpose of having a universal access program. So, because if you look at the the, the general scheme of things, if the private uh, telcos are already serving an area, why would government reinvest in that particular area? So, in terms of um, access, uh, around 30, 37% of Filipinos are online. But I think um, there, as I mentioned earlier, and that wasn't a joke, um, we have more Facebook users than internet users. So there, there seems to be a, a confusion already in terms of what the internet is and how that differentiates from zero rated content. Um, and I think there is a problem if you look at zero rated content as your solution to universal access, because there are a lot of implications in terms of um, how, what, how, does, how do these providers make money out of the data that they collect from people, and um, whether that would actually, in the long run, be uh, not beneficial because you are making the market actually smaller than it, you know, than it should be, just because the first, uh, the first provider already has um, basically would cover the population and then no other entrants could come in of course that would be the business the logical business model that would make sense if i were you know the facebook for example <laughs> so um quality wise we have one of the poorest in terms of quality um i'm a research fellow of learn asia and we've conducted broadband quality of service experience studies for five years throughout south and southeast asia and what we found out just last year is that the Philippine ISPs actually offer the lowest value for money if you compute in terms of how much uh, a kilobyte would cost you. And that is not something that we are proud of. We presented the results to the telcos, the regulator, the, the, uh, and also Congress. And um, fortunately, that has started, that has triggered, um, co together with the meme, I don't know if you're familiar, there was an, a meme of ASEAN countries. Um, and the average speed, and we were, yes, uh, the Philippines is actually one of the you know, bottom three, I think. So that together with the study that Learn Asia has done, we've been using that evidence-based um, you know, policy, uh, basically we're trying to promote evidence-based policy making. And um, we are trying to influence our, led, our regulator to look into not only access, but also quality, because that would act definitely impact on your value for money of consumers. Um, other than that, what else? Affordability, well, obviously. Um, if, you comp if you actually have, let's say, 1,000 pesos, you can only get one Mbps here. That's how bad it is. That's 22, about around $22, and that's very expensive, considering the, 
you know, that we are a developing country and you wouldn't, let's say, if, if you if you are uh, an individual, a common a common internet user, and you have, let's say, how much? Tw you're making twenty thousand pesos a month, for example. Would you spend one thousand pesos just to get one Mbps? So that there's definitely something wrong in that picture. So I'm going to ask Chris now to talk about any initiatives that Mozilla might have in in terms of improving internet access. Sure. So let me put this into context a little bit. I think we've talked about a lot of the, I think the most important and the most high profile aspects of the broader challenge of improving access. We've talked about infrastructure, um, which is one of the most important and one of the hardest. We've talked about government role in a couple of respects, one in censorship and one in sort of subsidization and provision regulations. And we've started to talk a bit about the economies of scale through the references to zero rating. So this is a good landscape. I wanna help flesh it out a little bit um, by talking about a couple of the things that Mozilla is doing, working with, with many carriers in Southeast Asia um, and others as well. So the first one is the idea that we don't just want to connect people to the internet. We want to empower them to create and control their internet experience. So what does that require in practice? Um, well, the way that we think about this is people need to have smartphones. A feature phone is not a good device for generating internet content. We're really taking advantage of the full benefits the internet has to offer. If it's all you can get, it's still a good tool. You can still communicate with it. You can load certain apps and use certain websites. But to really take advantage of the internet and to help try to close the digital divide, people need to have smartphones. So we've been working on this for a couple of years. <clears throat> we wrote our own operating system, the Firefox OS operating system uh, from scratch. It's web powered. Uh, and we've been working with device partners and carriers to deliver inexpensive smartphones um, to as many countries in the world as we can. It all goes through the carrier partners. So here in the Philippines, working with Cherry Mobile, we have a, a $23 Firefox OS powered smartphone, which we're very proud of. Um, but it's not just about giving people phones either. It's not just about the devices. It's also about letting them create content, letting them generate locally relevant content so that they perceive that it's their internet and that it's not just Western world or just American apps and content that they can appreciate, but it can really be theirs. So that we can tap into things like Johar's IXP in Indonesia, where they've done a terrific job of generating local content, but in many other countries in Southeast Asia and many countries in Africa, they don't have that experience. And, and so there's ways that we need to think about and work together to try to do that. And that's why Mozilla has our WebMaker initiative. <clears throat> We have built tools for people to make it easier for them to generate web pages and to generate content and to communicate with each other in hopes that we can build out of every community in the world something like what we have in Indonesia with this plethora of content. And the last piece, and I won't go into great detail on this because Raj and I were just on a panel that was mostly about this issue, um, is, is how do you deal with subsidization and the economies of scale here? So what we announced about three weeks ago um, we're going to be deploying Firefox OS phones through the Telco Orange in 13 countries in Africa, where in those countries you will pay 40 US dollars, you will get a Firefox OS smartphone, and you will get six months of free voice, text, and data, up to 500 megabytes of data a month. So this isn't zero rating, this is subsidized internet access. Um, and, and there's a lot of different reasons why that's happening. Um, this is not, we're not subsidizing this. This is Orange subsidizing this. And part of this is that the people at Orange really do want to help connect the next billion users. And part of it is that they want to bootstrap these markets. So I don't want to get into economies of scale in much depth, but there's a high fixed cost to building out a mobile network. And then the additional marginal cost of each user after that is relatively low. So the idea is to subsidize people up front, get a bunch of users on the network, and hopefully a bunch of them will continue to pay. And by starting with that larger number, you don't have to charge them as much as you did if you started with a smaller number because the fixed costs can be distributed a little bit more evenly. So there's both a, a sort of a mission here of let's try to connect the next billion people and also just a, a realistic like costs and economy, economics argument about how do you get to the point where the network makes sense and where people can hopefully pay less to get their data. So different things, different pieces of this puzzle, I think, complementing the, the infrastructure and the government role narrative. So I asked Mr. Chad to talk about APC's initiatives. 
Yeah, um, I think what I want to bring here is um, more experience outside of the region. I mean, we do work in the region, and um, um, Dev also is a member of APC. But one of the things, there's two things I guess I want to look at. One is in relation to digital migration. So the policies, what we do is we do research around digital migration. For example, one of the things we did in Africa is sort of a comparative study of what the country's policies are in migrating from analog to digital and what, what are the costs and what are the public access issues when you're looking at migration. So that I think is useful for other countries. Philippines is also, I mean, all countries I guess are going towards that um, um, goal. So I think there definitely are um, um, consultation issues in relation to um, um, whose voices should be included in the policy making and as well as public access that needs to be included in that and costs as well. Um, the other thing is this question around connecting the, the next billion. One of the things also that we're involved in is in, in a I, ITU's um, broadband commission, which looks at policies again around you know, um, laying out broadband. Um, and they are focused, one of the, the areas they focus in is gender and broadband. And, you know, a lot of the mobile operators now are looking at women as, as, as market, realizing that, wow, you know, we've been saying this all along, right, that more women are, are not connected. There's, there's sort of this equality around that, but now they've seen us uh, as really a market for, for this um, push around mobile. And I think when you think about this in relation to looking at policy and looking at, at, at program and, and you know how how to how to um, uh, program that, I think it's to think also beyond just women being markets because there really are other issues that you need to think of in relation to to women's access. Um, and and re related to that would be around language, for example. I mean, when you're thinking at at the internet, that that you know, if you want to empower people around the, the kind of the internet and that we own the internet, you look at language as well. You know, it's not just about the device, but it's also, when, if we're talking about content, I just happen to have this sheet of paper with me, uh, you know, with, with uh, for you know, in terms of uh, um, uh, percentage of content on the internet. And English is 55%. Guess what the next language is? The next one to 55%, English is top. Mm. Yeah, you'd think, right? Well, what I have here is Russian. It's six percent. So it doesn't make sense, you know, in terms of so. So you, what we're going to see is more and more and more and more English. And what does that mean in relation to access and the kind of content and the internet, you know, that we want? So I, I'm going to ask uh, Rajnes to talk about ISO. Okay. Thank you. Um, so it was interesting hearing all the various perspectives, the country perspectives as well. Of course, Chris and I had an interesting session just before. So I was quite was slightly surprised to hear net neutrality as well as zero rating come up in this panel, but okay, internet rights, why not? Um, in terms of what ISOP does, so ISOP does a lot of things around the world. Um, in terms of, you know, again, just picking on what I've heard, some of the things that we've been pushing, one is local content, uh, particularly in languages other than English or whatever the main stream languages are. Um, and that's actually been a bit of a challenge, uh, particularly in this region, in one particular country where she's from. Uh, I asked the question in a panel that, you know, do we need websites, et cetera, et cetera, in this country to be in English or in other languages? So this is about three years ago. Um, and the response from the room, more or less, was, no, no, we all speak English. English is fine. No, it's fine. Okay, this is in Delhi, mind you, so, okay, so in that context. And there were a couple of web developers in the room and I asked them the same question and they came back with the same answer because the money is in English. Okay. So just, just an interesting perspective there that I thought I'd share. Uh, in terms of getting costs down, cost of course is always a big, big issue. Um, one of the ways that we've been pushing from a technical level at least is something my friend here is doing, is looking at neutral IXPs. I mean, and ASEAN, the Southeast Asian nations in particular are very, very guilty of this problem. Uh, yesterday, in fact, we released one of our papers on this studying uh, Southeast Asian infrastructure. The issue in Southeast Asia in particular is that there's a, there's a, well, there's hardly any carrier, uh, uh, hardly any neutral IXPs. There are lots of IXPs, but they're all basically you know, nailed down with a particular carrier, a particular telco, et cetera, et cetera. The problem with that is it 
becomes that this is my network. I'll decide what I'll do, what we'll do. Um, with a neutral IXP, you know, everyone is free to connect. There's a very transparent way in which the, the, the peering happens between the, the providers. And ultimately, that brings down the cost because then you don't have to trombone. Tromboning is, you know, you said, for example, from the Philippines, it sends stuff off to Hong Kong to get to the next ISP in the Philippines, okay, which is crazy. Particularly when we start talking about international transit costs, which is very expensive in some parts of this region. Um, and it's crazy, but it still happens. You know, it happens here, it happens in Indonesia, it happens in Thailand, it happens everywhere. So these are very basic steps we could take. But the problem is, you know, I think, particularly from the telecom perspective, and just as a disclaimer, I come from the telecom world. I used to be. I'm a reformed telco, as my friends tell me. Um, the, uh, the, the issue has been that you know, it's always been protecting your investments, your network, your, your thing, right? But business models have evolved. And I think we need to look at how the larger business models that make things work, the telcos, the mobile codes, et cetera, et cetera. We need to, you know, infrastructure sharing is another one that we really need to look hard into. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of paradigm shift because of the internet and other technolo technologies and services that have come about. I think it's also high time we had a hard look and you know, this is where perhaps government can play a very important role in trying to facilitate, foster, encourage infrastructure sharing, spectrum sharing, um, looking at things like, you know, for example, here in Southeast Asia, we're moving to a common market here, the Asian economic community. Suppose you kick off this year. Uh, let's see how that goes. But one of the ideas behind that, of course, is that it's one big free market, similar to Europe. Um, that in itself is going to have many challenges in this region. If you look at Myanmar at one end and Singapore at the other end, there's a huge diversity in every category you can take off, basically. And then Philippines, Indonesia, Laos, Cambodia, they're all at different. There's the three clusters we identified where the issues are in the region in terms of where countries stand. So there's a lot of work to be done. And I think this is where the role of government, I think, is very important, um, where they can, you know, have the big, big, big picture look as opposed to having that old school thought of how things used to happen because it came out of the post and telecom department which became the incumbent telecom and then the post office was split off from that. So there's some very brief or not so brief comments. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to also ask Keith, I understand that you have done extensive work also in Africa, but this is more on um, freedom of expression, but I'm sure that you've also had a chance to talk to them about the level of internet access and particularly how this relates to uh, freedom of expression and human rights in Africa. Perhaps you can share some of those thoughts with us. In Africa or in general? In general. In general. Well, um, we think it is one of the um, uh, internet freedom. We think it is very important. Therefore, we, uh, we initiated the Freedom Online Coalition. Um, our country say when we talk say, about access, we what what we did say in our own country was first say to to make sure that what you said say that you have at least the infrastructure that you can that the infrastructure is open say for ISPs and all the others. Yeah, we did we had several instruments to to do that and to, to create this level playing field because that is important and it's also on net neutrality and what have you and the. Um, and then, of course, um, well, we have our own country, but also say we think it is because the web, I mean, the interesting thing of the World Wide Web, it is worldwide and that you can share, say, the information. So you can have things in your own country, but the, the additional value is that it is worldwide. So you have to, you have to say, encourage, say, worldwide freedom, say, of, of access to internet. So we created the uh, Freedom Online Coalition. And um, where we think, say, is um, uh, access to internet, say, is important, freedom, and uh, internet governance. That, that is where it, uh, what comes from as well. I mean, that comes to that you make, um, you know, agreements with, with other governments made to, to keep this uh, liberty, or this freedom, say, uh, on internet. Um, we, I mean, to... So we, we're not in favor of limitations. One of the things also what we initiate right now is to make sure that um, what we have, say, um, normally when we have export of goods which can be made or which you can can be used for bad things like, um, well, tanks, um, frigates, and what have you, um, they have to have an export license from us. 
now what we would like to do as well is also worldwide to uh, to encourage also countries to look into um, technologies that can prevent people from access to internet or surveillance technology and we think we should you should also have a look at that and especially so because sometimes especially when it can be dual use goods as we as we see it you know it can be for the good it can be for the bad but make sure where you export those uh, technologies to and we think that it contributes to you know at least prevents an easy um, uh, hindrance to the uh, to the internet or a worldwide surveillance of the internet which we are not in favor of of course so um, we've talked about your experiences in terms of um, the state of the internet in your respective countries and how you have um, undertaken projects to improve the level of access. Um, I'd also like to ask you, um, for instance, Ritu, you're, uh, you talked about improving access by providing wireless um, access in the communities. We see that there is a difference between the um, need for access to the internet between rural and urban areas. So uh, the project, or we are talking about the wireless for committees, that the project which we have been implemented as the, it has a committee ownership uh, kind of a thing, as well as the, which we feel it in the two ways that the, the content should be come from the bottom up approach as the content should be uh, developed by the committees instead of what we are forcing the content should be developed by or some uh, and the in an urban scenario what we are uh, we know all saying about that we need internet as well as we are aware that we need internet but in rural when we go that the, uh, we, need, we do not we tell them about the internet as it doesn't make any sense that what is why do they need the internet but when we tell them about internet, they are really happy to see the internet as an uh, access or information gathering tool. And once you give the device or once you give the technology or once you give the platform to them, it's really good to see that they are already coming and they're ready to explore that surrounding or environment. They are exploring their, uh, uh, what is the need of that internet. So the devices or the, it's just a medium on a communication when we talk about whether it's an urban or it's a rural scenario, but the need is the same. They want to access the internet or they want to access for the information purpose. Either it could be a livelihood or their agriculture or whatever they want to access. It's the same need. The, we cannot uh, marginalize them that they don't need it. We, we need to empower them. They're already empowered just that the, there's no infrastructure is there. Uh, the uh, content is, uh, English is so much uh, there that they don't under they are, are unable to search the uh, search the internet. So that's the content which needs to be developed by the local committee. So that's the thing which is the difference which we have uh, in our wireless for committees uh, uh, program. We have asked them to develop their own content. So it was helpful for us as well that when they develop their own content, we do not need to do anything. Else. They were already developing the content. Thank you. I, um, picking off from what you said, I'd also like to ask uh, Chris regarding your project with uh, Orange Telco. Um, based on the your presentation earlier, I would um, understand that this would only work because of economies of scale. So, um, how how will you be able to make this work for rural areas where the population is um, not that much? And uh, is there any plan to implement it in the last month? So that's that's a couple of different questions in one. I, I mean, I feel like the the uh, the way that we have structured what we're doing with Orange, it's everywhere. It's for everywhere in the country. But you're right. There's a, a question whether after the six month period expires, how many of those users will sign on, and, and how do those economies work out? Um, and and that's mostly what our carrier partners would deal with. We at Mozilla wouldn't get involved in that, um, not particularly. But there is you know, the, the theoretical question there of how to deal with, with rural areas where it's, it's trickier. I mean, the, the uh, spectrum works differently in different ways. And so in rural areas, you can use much lower frequency spectrum that has much greater distance that it carries. And so you can have 
fewer cell sites that are cheaper to maintain than the multiplicity of sites that you would need to maintain in an urban area. So there are ways to, to deal with this, but it is a very difficult problem. And, and sometimes, I mean, it, historically in the United States, um, the way that we have dealt with that is, is effectively through subsidization. The Federal Communications Commission takes in universal service fees and implements a, a federal policy of universal service in order to subsidize the more expensive connections to the more rural areas of the country. And, that's a framework that we needed to develop in order to try to achieve a vision of universal service. And it's tricky and there's a major government role in it in many different countries and will need to be ultimately. Um, you've mentioned subsidization. So I'd also like to ask the panelists, what do you think of the um, interplay between state action to improve internet access versus community action to improve internet access? <laughs> okay, there's, 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 yeah. That's very interesting, a very interesting question about the, the subsidizes because we have a very different uh, experience in Indonesia. The government does collect the universal service obligation, whatever does with the money, whatever they want, like in Pakistan. Right, so, but what's happening here in our country is we just got sick of that, sick inside, and we started building our own. I mean, really building our own and uh they simply stopped it just because it isn't in the government's program so everything that isn't a government program does not exist which comes to an answer what uh you told about uh the traffic going outside there's a few pictures here i don't know if i'm gonna show it there but the Indonesian traffic has never gone through the u.s since 2001 right but it's not a government project and the government doesn't recognize it. Hence, it doesn't exist. So that's kind of true in Pakistan. Yes, technically, yeah. If it isn't a government run, it doesn't exist. So the subsidized, we don't need. There's even this one case, First Media had this brilliant idea, creating a project, $10 per month, unlimited internet access, goes to the House of Parliament, they declined it because it was too cheap. So the private sector actually has the money, has the technology, has the willingness to do that. It simply is not allowed. That's the case in my country, at least. <laughs> and so, yeah, here's a thing I want to show. All right. If I can add something while this is being connected, to, we have had some similar um, situations in Pakistan with telcos offering really good SMS bundles. They're not free, but they're almost free. And then there was a petition in the court saying that by offering free SMS bundles, um, the moral values of the society are being affected because there are too many young people messaging, carrying on love affairs and whatnot. And then there was a directive by the government to stop offering those bundles, specifically those that were like nighttime bundles, you know, 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, unlimited SMS. So it's interesting to see how, you know, these things are offered by the corporate sector, if not the civil society, and yet clamp down, clamp down upon on the text of ideology or cultural or moral issues. Yeah. So, so I guess I'm curious to know what the lovers did now that they lost the SMS. I, I was going to ask them, did, did you use it? <laughs> did you use it? It's an all day one All right. So just, just a few pictures. So this is showing you what was happening in Indonesia. This is 97. This is the, 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 the red one is the internet exchange, right? We did this. As you can see, not all the ICs are connected to it. But this is what happens in the next year. So that's 98, right? More ICs are connected directly or indirectly. That's 2000. And this is what I told you. By 2001, everything is connected. The one on the right side is actually connected to Indosat. Indosat is connected to the exchange. So everyone is connected. And this is, as more ISPs grew, they're all connected to the exchange. And this is 2006, right? Everything is connected to a single thing. That red spot in the middle is actually one single device. So the whole country is run on one single router. Nothing from Indonesia to Indonesia passes through the US anymore. 
but since it is not a government program, it does not exist. <laughs> okay, how uh, the growth of Indonesia is, this is the data I've collected in the end of 2013, right? Our population has grew 234 to 345, internet users to million to 55 million. The peak traffic of the local internet, three max to 67.4 gigs. All right, so our population grew by 9%, internet users grew by 2,650%. Our peak traffic grew to 2,246,567%. We have a growth of 2 million local traffic of the internet in 10 years. Yeah, the only problem is it doesn't exist. All right, so what we're trying to do here in the Philippines is Philippines is blessed that the government is not that involved. So you have this power to do what can be achieved by the community. And having Mozilla and the ISOC on board right now, you make it faster. We needed 12 years to do this. You can do it in three, four years with the help of these guys. Uh, so that's actually <laughs> what I want to show you. All right, so yeah, right? So just on to that, so in June, we're trying to do something on that right here. In the yes, and, and what we're doing now is actually connecting the Philippine Exchange, the Indonesian Exchange, and the Malaysia Exchange. Not going to, we've actually connected the exchange, right? And that isn't also recognized by the government. So now they're having this project called the ASEAN Exchange Project, which we have done two years ago. Who's leading on that? The ASEAN Exchange Project? No one. <laughs> it's the internet. It's supposed to be a connectivity of everyone. No one controls the internet. Everyone has a say on the internet. And that's what the Open ISP is. There is no single body that controls the open ISP. It isn't under any organization. It isn't under the government. It isn't under any commercial entity. It belongs to everyone that is on the internet. And the ASEAN exchange, what we think, is also under that uh, same mindset that this belongs to the ASEAN community. Not No one single country has a dominant power over it. Are you, are you unique? I don't know. They don't like let me out much. Yes. I think so, but uh, going to the Philippines, I think it can be actually replicated here. Uh, our telcos here would like us to believe that we are unique. So in one of the Senate hearings that I attended, it, because um, there is an ongoing Senate investigation on why Philippine internet is slow and expensive, and I've attended all of them, not because I was invited by the telcos, I just wanted to be there to make sure that civil society and you know research organizations are there represented. So they kept, they kept telling us, you're unique, you're unique. Then I told them, Indonesia has 17,000 islands. 10,000 islands more than the Philippines, and all of them, all telcos and ISPs there are 100% connected to just one internet exchange point. And then they could, they, they were quiet after that. So just, that just actually uh, shows how, when, when we stop questioning, uh, you know, private companies like telcos in the case of the Philippines about why uh, the service is like this, why, you know, internet services expensive why is it that we only have less than uh 40 percent of the population with internet access then they'll just keep telling us all the cliche answers and you know we just we just have to keep pushing um also the government to to help you know we have to help the government actually yes. understand yes. the situation and then look for you know champions within the government because there are there are you know, yeah. gems <laughs> within the government um, that you know who who would carry carry uh, on this you know this uh, this reform. So I'm sure there are also some people in the audience wondering if they're unique. Anybody wants to ask a question from our panelists? I have a question. Is it unique? 
Um, well, I, I, maybe a bit. Um, I have a question to you. You uh, you just showed your um, uh, the setup in Indonesia. And yeah. There is only one router, of course. Yes. At least needs to question how vulnerable is your network. Yeah. Single point of failure. We pray a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it is vulnerable, but it becomes it. it, it the answer is is very political. It's hard enough to get the telcos to connect to a single exchange. If you have multiple routers in different locations for redundancy, they simply just won't connect to the redundant server, the redundant router. That's 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 the answer because it's it's a matter of pride. Now I'm telecom of Indonesia. Now I've abide by your rule once. I'm this big giant company and you're just a nobody, Johar. Now you're telling me to connect there. They just simply won't do it. So it's not, we couldn't make a redundant uh, router. It's hard because of the pride of the telcos. So just a very quick follow-up question. You don't provide international connectivity through your nope. right? So if your router died, yep. They, the network would still be technically connected. It's just everybody would go yes. via Hong Kong yes. to get to yes. each other. Yes. So. Yes. And one, one more thing about that more is expensive. More, like, much, much expensive. It's the peak traffic now is actually 180 gigs. All right. So back in 2001, May going to the US was 88,000 US dollars per month. So divide, multiply by the gigs. Now, one thing why I was invited here, what she said was, uh, we're amazed this Akamai study said Indonesia has risen in terms of quality 44% last year. And my answer was, they were wrong. I mean, it's always been like this. The problem is Akamai's algorithm always calculated how much, how fast the traffic is going through their CDNs, which goes outside. But this 180 gigs of data that a cell phone user in Indonesia connects to a local content provider in Indonesia going through the open IT is never calculated by Akamai. So I think they realized that there was something wrong. And the only reason, the only way they can correct that is telling everyone that Indonesia miraculously last year improved their speed by 44%. <laughs> You're from Iran? From Iran. Sorry, I, I can try and follow up that for, for, from my uh, kind of experience. Remember I told you we're not under the government and everything? So that's, that's the way we protect our human rights. The government has no case and no power to see what passes through the local exchange. So that's the power that we have. I know for a fact that uh, most of the governments that I know in this region always says we need to protect the internet from pornography. And they put these little devices to weed out the pornography. But there is not a single country that I know that has that power of filtering pornography that has never used it to block their political rivals. So, yes, do that. But the control has still to be with the people. If there's something going on in Iran, there's no way the government should be able to switch off your internet. Uh, uh, and the other thing is, of course, uh, that it is still connected uh, to the international, to the World Wide Web. It's not, say, completely isolated. No? That, is, that is the other thing as well. I mean, as, uh, as you said as well, if they, if they say, melt down, then everybody's still connected, but they have to pay more. Let me just add sort of a third regional reference or comparison point here, and that's Europe. So in Europe, there are a lot of conversations now about the concept of a European cloud. Um, so we've gone and we've talked to, to people in the 
commission and the parliament about this. And, and our point of view is always, you want to build a cloud infrastructure in Europe? Great, please do. You want to mandate that all European citizen data be stored in the European cloud and not in non-European clouds? That breaks the global open web. So it's really about whether you are additive to the network or whether you are closing it in what you're doing. <laughs> with the Allison's. Um, so we struggle a lot with the kill switch and network disconnectivity on in the context of security, of course. Um, like very recently, just yesterday, we had the Pakistan Day Parade and the mobile networks in Islamabad have been switched off for the whole week uh, for extended period hours. So it was two hours a week back, then three hours, then six hours. And it's not something that... Um, it's not a unique happening. It happens usually at times when people are most vulnerable and then they're suddenly without mobile and internet. Um, and we have been doing this research thinking that, okay, this has to be the worst thing happening ever. And then we found out, no, it happens in other countries as well. So for people who are sitting on the panel, my question would be, have you experienced uh, this in different countries and then how do you go, go about actually dealing with it when the government comes up with um, legit reasons for you know shutting it down saying oh mobile uh, to bomb trigger and would you rather die or be without sms for a few hours right that actually happened recently in manila because the pope was here so all of a sudden uh, all mobile uh, subscribers lost um, connection, basically lost signal. And we thought it was just uh, a downtime, but no, uh, it, it, it was revealed while it was happening. Uh, we, we received an SMS that no, the, it was the government, um, it was a go an order by the government for cellular, um, all cellular companies to shut down, basically shut down um, mobile services because to protect the Pope. So, I, there was a mix. There was, sorry, it was a it was God's act. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, and we are eighty three percent Catholic, so we all complied. So twenty <laughs> percent. <laughs> so that's a that's a very relevant and interesting question. I actually don't know how to answer it because for me, being Catholic, I wanted to protect the Pope, of course, but. But at what expense? And why were we not informed? Because everyone was saying, of course you weren't informed because then you would have also informed the whoever wanted to do something bad to the Pope. Okay, that makes sense. So, but, so what, how about the, at what cost are we, are we willing to, to protect, um, you know, um, citizens? Um, and why, why is it that, um, why is it that the telcos can just easily shut down their, you know, services, but when it's in terms of the clamor of people to make their services better, then they don't do anything about it. So it's actually a very tricky question. So I just wanted to add uh, one reference point. This didn't, it, it happens in many, many places all around the world. It happened in Oakland, California about three years ago. There were BART protests going on, just normal, normal minor protests about public transportation systems and the Oakland Police Department put pressure on the local cellular network operator to temporarily shut down their cellular network to make it harder for people to coordinate and to protest. It was a ridiculous incident and there was a lot of public pressure in the U.S. against that. But um, I mean, I, I can give you a framework of what, what I believe the answer to be to this, which is democratic processes that develop rules and processes that governments must go through in order to decide whether to do something like this. And then the most important part, and the part that almost never exists in practice, is accountability after the fact. So that if they didn't follow their own rules, they need to be held accountable and no one should be above the law. Just also, in, I was in South Africa in March and I don't know, last month, and this happened because, the, uh, but it's actually security that, um, it was there was protest against um, the against the ANC, um, and 
there was it was being covered inside the parliament and the signal went off completely went off so the the, the slogan was in a protest of media was to bring back the signal to bring back because that's what they did they, they sort of killed that at that, at that point so it does i guess it's for different reasons really no? So because this is a human rights uh, thing, you know, uh, so what happened in the media is this is very interesting. We have the exchange I told you. So uh, practically, logically, after 9-11, everyone came over to uh, the exchange. Uh, as, as I mentioned, I don't really like working with the government. I don't play well with others, is the word. So I'm civilly disobedient. So they came up here. Okay, Johar, people are dying. Now you have to let us in. We have to see all the traffic that's passing through the exchange so we can get the bad guys. Like one thing is logical, that's truth. But the second thing is, no, I don't really feel comfortable with it. So I thought in 2008, our peak traffic was uh, 30 or 3 gigs or something. One, 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 one giga, right? So they came with this, this device, which was 100 megs. They couldn't get the traffic of one gig. So I said, yeah, please connect. I'll pass all the traffic to you, to your 100 meg link. Now the next year they came up with a one gig device trying to get all the traffic and our traffic was 30 gigs. Right, so now technically a Cisco router, you can only do uh, port mirroring to a physical interface. So the biggest physical interface now is a 10 gig. So now they've come up with a 10 gig device and my traffic is 180 gigs, right? So we let them, we let them see the traffic. We just make more and more traffic to confuse them. They couldn't see anything, you know, a 10 gig traffic on a 180 gig peak. So yes, I am abiding what the government or the intelligence community is asking me but I'm trying not to let them see anyway. So yeah, you can try and do that. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So any more questions? Okay, um, I think we've already come full circle from the problem of access to having access and then having it taken away. So I, um, I'd like to ask our speakers to, if, um, to make some recommendations that they think um, others could um, take on in order to improve internet access in their respective countries? Well, I think, say, one of the, uh, what, what you brought forward, say, on the Pope and things were being disclosed and what you said as well, Chris. So, um, uh, the internet, of course, seems like a whole different world, and in a sense it is. But when it comes to, you know, to human rights and justice, it's not. And so, the accountability you have, say, in, in the real actions, you also have on the internet and it shouldn't be that on the internet that suddenly there are different rules than, than on say that than, than offline but the same rules apply and it also counts for government for governments and what they do so the the take home that i or the the point that i would deliver here is it's not just about not only is it not just about connecting to Facebook, I would argue it's not just about connecting to the internet, it's really about connecting to the web. And the reason I make that distinction is that it's not just about connecting. It's not just about putting content in front of people so that they can consume it. It's really a, a very important part of this that I wanna make sure that we never lose is that the internet is us, it's made of us, it's built by us and the things that we do and that we create and contribute to it. And that's a really important part of this ecosystem and of how we build and support access and, and why. So, um, you know, just sort of leading on from that, what I would say is that, and I think you've mentioned this before anyway, Chris, that, you know, when someone goes online, the new billions, for example, billion, billions, depending on how you look at it, they go in as content consumers. But really, I think the, cap no, the key thing there is that they need to be content creators. Yes. And we need to provide them with an environment that will let that flourish, which I don't think we do very well. In some places we do, in some places we don't. I think it's more no than yes on that. So that would be good. The kill switch is a really bad idea. So I don't know, there's been examples already. Yeah, kill the kill switch. Because, you know, putting in the surveillance device is great, 
from the law enforcement perspective. But the problem is depending on who's in power when. What the device will be used for, we have no control over. So that's why you know, Johar's point is quite interesting. Sure, I'll give you the 10 gig. Oh, come with 100 gig next year. I'm up to you know, one terabit now, so, you know, so good luck with that. Um, and, 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 and you know, finally, um, the internet, and I think we all would potentially agree, it's really transformed lives and people over the last like, two decades that it's become mainstream. Uh, but there's still a whole lot to come yet. You know, I mean, this, this was just a preview. That's the way I look at it. You know, the main show is just about to begin. So whatever actions we do individually, collectively, be it from the policy side, be it from the regulatory side, be it from private sector, civil society, activism side, we need to ensure that, you know, we don't put a damper on the internet. You know, it needs to continue growing, evolving, and basically having a life of its own, because that's what it's had to date. And it's been pretty, you know, it's done a pretty good damn job. Uh, coming from that. Yes, actually, uh, we were taught in Indonesia that internet belongs to everyone, and we built the internet in the early 90s. Cisco, Dell, uh, hand to hand together to have every access. So now we've come in part, we've come into the Philippines that the community can actually build the internet, and we've successfully done that, is the proof in Indonesia. So my only suggestion is for the big corporates like Facebook and everyone else, you know, to build the internet, the government isn't the only one you're supposed to talk to, or you're not only supposed to talk to the big corporates, which is what is happening now in this region. So they kind of forgot what they taught us in the 90s. So we're here to remind you. Um, I'll get back to uh, empowerment rather than just access. And uh, um, what we are doing, uh, I don't know whether it's a suggestion, it's an experiment that uh, we are doing Pakistan and it's like small movements starting around since Urdu is our national language and the script is very different from English and we're still struggling uh, with font compatibility. So now there are talks about kind of standardizing the Roman Urdu and Roman Urdu is like when you use English alphabet to type Urdu and there's no standardization. Obviously you can't really spell it. So I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm constantly hearing talks from really different groups like, oh, there's Roman Sindhi and there's Roman Punjabi and there's Roman Potwari. And uh, I'm not really comfortable with this, but I like the idea that people are experimenting. Um, we are also exploiting some of the loopholes and we just got a funding for putting up a mesh network we don't have the permission for, but then there's nothing barring us. So it's technically not legal, but technically it's not illegal either. We don't know where it will go, uh, but I think it's time that we start pushing some boundaries, um, making the government see that, okay, if you are not being proactive, uh, civil society, other actors are going to step in, and you just need to get into this debate now. You, you need to start getting serious about it. Otherwise, things might happen that you are not really comfortable with. Uh, so kind of forcing both through quotes and through starting initiatives that are technically not illegal, uh, but without permits. Uh, that might be one of the way to get the engagement that we haven't been getting so far. Uh, for like in India, what we have been doing is, is like a, providing the access on the implementation side. We believe that the information, access to information is a major source to uh, make them empower anyone. So, uh, so that's for all which we are doing is so it's not Connecting is not the solution, it's the what kind of information they want to receive it as also that we see it as a solution. And uh, <clears throat> apart from that, like uh, what we have been seeing that there, uh, India is doing a lot of things in the digital India mission and there's a lot of campaign from the government side. On the contrary side, there have been a blockage. There are, have been a, it's the recent uh, 32 websites have been blocked by the government, including uh, the website which has been uh, this is a Vimeo website from uh, owned by YouTube was blocked by and then the SMS blockages and then is happening in, also is happening. So looking at the perspective from the side of uh, India is providing this is a free space everything is free but on the other side there is a blockage and the content blockage on the side. So telling them about being an evidence-based approach, having said that these are the models, there are existing models, and these are the models which we can bring it up into the uh, something and 
front of a government. If you cannot do this thing, we are ready to doing it. We are already doing it. If you cannot adopt this model, we are already doing this model. So what's the, uh, if you, then they might come and they might approach us to that as a model. I just want to say two things. First, I think God, we should stop saying that internet is a human right if you, we don't really mean it. Like in the Philippines, yes. government yes. officials keep saying, and politicians, internet is human right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they put up all these barriers to entry so that you know only two telcos will operate, and the local governments will keep saying that yes, we understand internet is human right, and then they would impose 40 permits before a telco can put up one single base station or tower so you know if you if you believe that internet is truly a human right then you have to facilitate basically access and you have to ensure that the market structure is in such a way that there the the providers can can offer affordable service and that and, uh, at a particular level of quality that is acceptable and then the second thing is that uh, citizens can do something. In the Philippines, actually, democracy.net.ph, where Cecil is one of our moderators, is one of the founders, they drafted a bill called the Magna Carta for Philippine Internet Freedom. And they drafted that out of personal advocacy. They, they did not know what will happen uh, uh, when they drafted it. They, they crowdsourced the bill. So when it was finished, they lobbied to several legislators and fortunately two legislate two senators and one congresswoman filed the bill so it can happen there are initiatives that um, citizens individuals can join and um, we're actually um, i'm actually um, very supportive of this bill because it looks at um, ICT as a, a, an ecosystem and not just you know looking at it from an infrastructure point of view or from um, from a pricing or marketing part, point of view. So um, we need to seek out these initiatives and support them and really take the time out to do something and not just um, wait for the private uh, companies to provide access or wait for the government to do something. Um, there are things we can do. Okay. Uh, just a short point. I think one of the things that most excited me in the last few months is wireless going back to community wireless networks it's a way to be able to um and if it comes to that question that a uh, friend from iran asked you know it's, it really is um yes we need to get get out there and we need to keep you know to inform to share information but i think there's also strengthening the community and sharing that access and i think that model really helps Will really make a difference. It can actually make a difference in in terms of improving access, making it more affordable, and actually strengthening co strengthening communities in a, in a real way and getting us to talk to each other again in the local. Thank you, Chad, and thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon.